A very good morning to you and welcome to the show. This is The Key Point with me, Abna Tebi. It is a pleasure to be coming your way once more with another episode of the show and we are going to be looking at issues of national concern. It is the 17th day of July 2021 and yes, another Saturday is here. We will be looking at matters that made it to the headlines, some major headlines and we will be subjecting that to some serious analysis here on the show this morning. We're coming to you live from the studios of TV3 here in Accra. We're also live on 3FM 92.7 online. We are at 3news.com, also on Facebook at TV3 Ghana. The show runs from now till 9.50 a.m. where we bring conversations to a close. But obviously before then, as usual, we would have done some serious justice to the topics outlined for conversation. There's a whole lot coming your way this morning and we shall be looking at or starting off with an issue that we have themed another threat on a journalist stemming the tide of attacks. Now this is coming against the background of the fact that on a program on Net2 TV on 9th July 2021, MP for Asim Central, Honorable Kenya de Japon, who doubles as the Chairperson of the Interior and Defence Committee of Parliament, speaking predominantly in P, made various statements about a particular journalist, Erastus Asaridonko, of the multimedia group and particular uh, media network within the multimedia group family, that is Joy FM. Now the statements in question have so far received condemnation from the media fraternity and other quarters, as the said statements are considered to be an attack on the media. Now the multimedia group has since then lodged a formal complaint with the Ashanti Regional Command of the Ghana Police Service. Now there's also confirmation that the police have responded to the said complaint and have indicated that the complaint is being given the attention it deserves. On the show this morning, we shall be looking at the statements made by Honorable Kenya D.A. Japon and matters arising, and we shall be interrogating the issues as well around the safety of media practitioners. Then we'll turn our attention also to matters concerning the emoluments of presidential spouses and Article 71 office holders. We're asking whether this is a quest for accountability as we delve into this subject. Now the debate about allowances and or salaries for presidential spouses continued this week. The first and second ladies returned the sums paid them as allowances from uh, 2017 till date and have declined any allowances to be paid them in the future. The question is, where does this development lead us or end us? Does the return of the monies resolve this very important issue about the recommendation of a professor in Tiamwa Beidu Committee in that report that they submitted to the president regarding emoluments of Article 71 office holders? Now we shall be interrogating or looking at this issue into some detail later on in the program. Obviously we'll touch a bit on um, happenings coming from the quarters of the Ajra hearings. This week they continue their sittings. So we'll touch briefly on that before we launch into the major topics for conversation this morning. Now this is where we'll take a quick break. When we come back we will begin with our first topic which has to do with attack on a journalist and we're asking the question are we stemming the tide of attacks regarding media practitioners when it comes to the issue about media uh, freedom or press freedom. Indeed, it promises to be an exciting, stimulating and thought-provoking conversation as usual. We encourage you to stick with us. Stay tuned. We will be right back. Welcome back. This is a key point. We're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7, online at 3news.com and also at TV3 Ghana, that's on Facebook. Um, we will be starting off the conversation looking at um, the issue about attacks on a journalists, particularly looking at a certain statements made by the Honorable Kennedy of Japan in respect of uh, multimedia group journalist Erastus Asari Donko. But before that, we'll re quickly touch on uh, developments coming from the quarters of Ajra regarding uh, the committee hearings, which continued this week. I'll quickly introduce the panelists uh, for this part of the conversation we currently have with us on Zoom. Uh, Mr. Emmanuel Bombande, he is a UN 
a senior mediation advisor. Good morning, uh, Mr. Bombandi. It's good to have you. Hello, good morning, and uh, good morning to your viewers. Very well. We also have on Zoom uh, Mr. Adib Sani. He is a security analyst, and we're also happy to have you. Um, Adib, good morning. We're we happy to have you. Can you hear me? Very well. We'll try to get um, Adib on. But in the meantime, let's start off with Mr. Bombande. Mr. Bombande, um, as indicated, we'll be moving on shortly to um, look at events coming from the quarters of Ejra regarding the three-member committee that continued their work uh, in the course of the week. We'll put there's a story that has been put together uh, to put matters in perspective. So let's take a listen to that and I come back to you, uh, Mr. Bombande. Even before the Justice Kumsin-led committee began work, there were little expectations from many quarters. After the initial 10-day period expired, an additional six days meant a number of witnesses would appear to give testimony starting the 2nd of July. Deputy Ashanti Regional Police Commander DCOP David Ajemejeman told the committee despite Peking intelligence about the planned disturbances, the police went to the area without adequate crowd control equipment. We didn't anticipate that it would um, degenerate into um, shooting. Yes, Our right. objective was first to protect life and property and, of course, to maintain law and order. General Officer Commanding for the Central Command, Brigadier General Afor, maintained, but for the intervention of a military, more casualties would have been recorded that day. So, for what we did that day, we believe and strongly believe that there will have been more deaths if you actually wanted to use proper force or fire indiscriminately, more would have died. But we saw that only we, we tried to maim the people. We used the minimum force not to create more problems. So, but with that minimum force, the effect was there. For commanding officer of a 4th Infantry Battalion, Lieutenant Colonel Kwesi Wari Pepra, a soldier captured in a viral video kneeling to take aim at the protesters, did not fire the gun. But that account has been challenged by residents and eyewitnesses. Abdul Nasiru Yusuf, his brother of one of the deceased. Lord, I then saw one of the military men having knelt down and pointed his gun. Lord, he also he got up and cut again. She held back. And shot again. Wife of a late social activist and fixed the country campaigner, Ibrahim Kaka, that Sahada Tuhudu, was not sure about the mandate of a committee. We are not investigating your husband's death. No. That is not the mandate of the committee. Our mandate includes what happened on the 29th and Things that led to the event of the 29th when the military moved in. The emotional widow told the committee, per her conversations with her late husband, before his death, she's convinced he may have been killed because of his activism. One of the key witnesses, Sadia Fuseini, who is a tenant in the house of a slain activist, gave a chilling account of how Kaka was murdered. She also told the committee she was initially scared to speak up. You don't can it. Well, first, my husband was not there. But, and because I'm also a woman, I was afraid to tell the truth for him to turn it over me. It's unfortunate that you have to find a place to hide yourself. And uh, that is uh, the system we are in as uh, people. We normally don't want uh, to hear the truth. Yes, because uh, the truth is very bitter in the mouth, but when you swallow it, you feel relieved. The committee has also been unequivocal about the role of the media in the disturbances. Journalists from Multimedia Group and City TV who appeared before the committee to testify took some bashing. Statements from particularly the chairman yesterday almost suggested as though well, they have concluded and they know the facts already uh, and that the whole thing uh, was inspired and uh, instigated by 
the media without providing a single shred of evidence. Many others, including the under fire municipal chief executive, Sali Subamba, and medical superintendents of a drug government hospital, have also taken their turn. The residents, families of victims, and traditional leaders say they expect justice to be served after all is said and done. Meaning that assure the Dagomba chief, the people of Ejra, and the people of Ghana that whatever information, evidence that has been given to us as a committee, we will do justice to it. Right, so that was a wrap on um, the Ejra hearings there put together uh, to put matters in perspective right here, uh, indicating that a number of persons have taken their turn at uh, the committee's hearing ranging from traditional authorities, media practitioners, security couples, residents, and even members of the late Carcass family. Again, let me introduce our panel uh, so far on the show right now. We have Mr. Imano Bombande, a UN senior mediation advisor joining us on Zoom. Also joining us on Zoom is Mr. Adib Sani, a security analyst and executive director of Jatike Center for Human Security and Peace Building. Good morning, uh, Mr. Bombandi and uh, Mr. Adib Sani. It's good to have you both. Good morning. Thank you. Great. Uh, let me start with you, Mr. Bombandi. Um, looking at what happened um, with the hearings, uh, the Justice Kumsin Committee hearings, uh, which has been tasked to look into uh, the circumstances that led to the uh, 29th June unfortunate incidents in um, Ejra. Um, yesterday, I believe, was uh, the last day uh, for the committee's work. Your thoughts on the process so far? First of all, uh, I appreciate the invitation, and I need to make a disclaimer to the UN does not put me in the category of somebody who speaks for the UN. Very My well. role is in an advisory capacity, Very well. and so I'm independent uh, in that sense. Very well, we appreciate um, that. And, and having served in government, uh, I am in a position to be able to appreciate the challenges that confront us. Sure. Uh, first of all, at, at, for me, the emphasis is how does the investigation help us to better understand the environment in which when there are protests, when there are demonstrations, mm -hmm there will be an effective coordination of how our security agencies are able to deal with this protest in such a way that two things happen. One, that the right to demonstrate and, the, and, and protest is preserved and actually allowed, mm. but at the same time, a crowd control mechanism in terms of good practice is institutionalized mm. to ensure that when people protest, it does not result in killings, as we saw in Ejura. Right. If I frame it in this overall broad objective, the question is, how, how have we come in terms of the uh, investigation so far? And I think that's what Ghanaians would be more interested in seeing as an outcome. Mm. The reason I say this is, if you were to permit me to make comparisons, mm -hmm. we've all been following the events down south in South Africa, particularly in the city of Deban. We all saw that at a point in time, the government needed to uh, bring on board the military to help the police in stopping the riots. But Ghanaians also saw that the military was restrained there was never any attempt to try and uh, create a situation in which you want to shoot on the crowd, you want to use the type of force that in itself is a crowd control mechanism. So my first observation is, when we talk about the use of force, the use of force should never be to the extent that it can lead to injuries and it can lead to deaths. Even if, unfortunately, it results as we saw in, 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 in the case. So there needs to be another uh, approach which basically suggests that 
we cannot have excuses about the lack of a proper equipment. Mm. But then those become excuses. But you cannot have people losing their lives. And then we hear excuses such as there was inadequate equipment. And to that extent, we try to project what could have happened if that type of force was not uh, applied. Okay. And that, for me, is a broad uh, uh, generality to suggest that protests will continue to happen. And we could talk about that in the context of when there is a widening gap, a widening wealth gap, in which you have a minority that is a tiny minority from the middle class upwards in wealth, and then you have an overwhelming majority that continue to grow poor. Mm -hmm. And the type of anger for various reasons, and not particularly in any political dispensation, will continue to happen Very well. as long as the broad environment permits it. Well. So what we need to do is to improve on the practice mm -hmm. and ensure that there is good practice in how there is crowd control when there are protests. Very well. So essentially, we should brace ourselves for you know more of these until I mean, to, so far as that we are not dealing with that disparity between you know the haves and the haves nots. Very well t said. Um, I'll quickly move to Adib Sani. Adib, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Very well. Good. Uh, so yes, uh, you've been following developments uh, from the Justice uh, Kumsin Committee hearings and all. What um, has stood out for you so far, particularly looking at you know their last weeks? Um, performance or the hearings? Well, well, first of all, let me say a special good morning to uh, Mr. Bumbandi. Mm. Um, apart from the, the fact that he's someone who inspires me, he is an in-law, but perhaps he doesn't know. <laughs> uh, but he would understand. Edmond's yeah. wife is his sister. Okay. Only, only he would understand. <laughs> ah, well, we leave that to the two of you. <laughs> okay. Right. So, I mean, um, from day one, I've been quite categorical in the fact that, I mean, these are persons, uh, I mean, the committee members who have distinguished themselves in their areas of specialization over the years. And the fact that such a huge responsibility uh, that has garnered a lot of controversy and discourse. Everybody seems to be talking about it. I mean, um, international media even picked it up. Um, I'm sure they wouldn't want to put themselves to shame, so uh, they will do a good job. Um, almost everybody who mattered uh, featured um, faced the committee. Um, almost all the questions that I personally had in mind were asked. However, I thought that sometimes uh, they were a bit too diplomatic with uh, some of the persons who appeared before the committee because there were some things that were said that I think um, calls could have been punched. Uh, I think they, they could have improved further. For example, uh, the Ashanti regional minister said he wasn't uh, uh, in a Jura. Uh, he wasn't in Kumasi, he was in Accra uh, for a meeting. That is why he couldn't hold... Uh, a, a regional security council meeting to take a decision on what was going on. I, and it ended there. No, I think that it could have improved uh, uh, further. Mm. There were a lot of discrepancies. There was a lot of confusion and inconsistencies, and especially what the military had to tell us and what the police said. Even within the police, there were some uh, discrepancies. Um, mm. Whilst the military said there's a likelihood shots were fired from the protests for protesters, uh, the, the, the police said, no, we, we, we seized some two pump action guns, but uh, no shot was fired from the protesters. Come to think of it, I mean, there's this uh, clear difference between uh, bullets from a rifle and pellets uh, from, from a shotgun. So I, I, I thought that uh, they, they could have found out on the spot that indeed someone had fired from the crowd or not. Mm. Sometimes I also found um, some of the statements by the committee members a bit too judgmental. Um, for example, the chairperson uh, spoke about uh, the fact that the truth is bitter, and you know, so I, I found it quite <laughs> upward. I mm. mean, knowing full well that 
this is just the beginning and a lot of work uh, has to be done going into the future. But overall, I think my general assessment is positive. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they've done a good work, but it doesn't end there. When the chairperson was asked what his expectations are, he was categorical. I don't have any expectations because mine is to submit a report containing recommendations to the interior minister. Okay, whatever he does with it, mm, I'm done. I'll go mm -hmm. back to my way of life. You know? Right. So um, this we wait and see. Not this is not the alpha and omega mm -hmm. uh, solution wise to mm -hmm. what is going on in the area, but it's a giant step in the right direction. Very well. Uh, towards bringing peace uh, Very well. to Adria. Very well. Ultimately, we, we await uh, the, 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 the report that will be issued by this committee and we'll see what is made out of it because obviously that is the major concern for every uh, concerned Ghanaian. Now we'll move on quickly to this uh, issue about another attack on another journalist. Now on a show um, or a program on Net2 TV um, called The Attitude on the 9th of July 2021, MP for Asin Central, the Honorable Kennedy A. Japon, uh, who doubles as a chairperson for the Interior and Defense uh, Committee in Parliament, made certain statements. And that statement uh, is what we're going to be looking at as it relates to Mr. Erastus uh, Asari Donko of the multimedia group family. And um, a number of issues have been said about this. We will be looking at that. Um, I'll start with you, Adib, on this occasion. Um, have you um, listened? to this um, 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 audio or this statement made by Kennedy e Japan. Yes, I did. I did. Um, I, I did, as a matter of fact, more than once. Very well. Um, the, Adib, can you hold on for me? We'll, we, we want to put things in better perspective. We're going to look back at some statements that the Honorable uh, Kennedy e Japan has made in the past. And that has, you know, those statements have come back uh, to the fore of public discourse in respect of this new statement that he has made. And so let's take a listen or let's take a look back on some of the statements made by the uh, Honorable Kennedy Japan MP for Asin Central. Right, so um, we have uh, Mr. Kennedy Japan's uh, statements here. We've titled the Kennedy Japan's controversies and dated June 28, 2018. Um, he was held before the Privileges Committee for allegedly um, describing parliament as um, useless. In 2019, um, he put Ahmed Swale's pictures on live TV and described him as very dangerous, encouraged viewers to beat him, assuring uh, whatever happens, I'll pay. That's what he's, uh, he said. He was later uh, murdered. Then in September 2020, uh, the Honorable MP was charged with contempt after describing a high court judge as stupid. He later apologized. Uh, May 2021, the MP accused the Ghana Police Service of knowing the killer of Ahmed Swale, but failing to arrest the suspect. Uh, the list goes on July 2021, uh, he makes life-threatening comments about multimedia journalist Erastus and impugned wrongdoing on the multimedia group. So this is where we are currently uh, with uh, the Honorable um, Kennedy Ejapon. And so putting things in perspective right here, listening to what he said recently in respect of Erastus, uh, what, what, what do you make of that? Well, it is, it is um, disturbing. Um, it is not something we can allow to pass by, as always. Uh, we, 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 we have come to be so used to the fact that uh, Honorable Kennedy, Japan, he's a firebrand, he's, he's shut down, he says this as it is, and all that. No, I think it is time to call him to order. Um, you see, politicians, just as celebrities, just as traditional rulers, just as religious uh, men of God, um, garner some level of following. They inspire the masses. I don't know if you've read about the Grand Davidians in, in the U.S., I think somewhere 1994, 95, Texas, 
when his church was besieged by security forces in the U.S. and uh, there was a siege that resulted in the death of uh, dozens, including children, at his church because he felt that the world was coming to an end and uh, they should stand their grounds. And uh, the, the, the story about Jim Jones, uh, who was also a preacher in the U.S. and later moved with his followers to uh, uh, French-speaking uh, Guyana, and uh, he asked them to drink cyanide, and close to a thousand of those who were, were killed. Um, politicians, whatever they say, has a direct implication on the thought processes and opinions and perceptions of people they, they inspire, okay? So you might say this for your audience, however, it has implications and it is not the first time. And like I always say, if really we were a serious country, excuse my language, but if really we were a serious country, um, the Honorable Minister would have been hauled in by the police and asked uh, tough questions. Let's not forget, it was under the same circumstance, beat him up and I would pay. That's our colleague. And I speak, I, I mean, I, I, I get emotional when I speak about this because I am a journalist myself. I'm a member of the Ghana Journalist Association. Same circumstance, Ahmed Swali was killed. And for a chairperson of Defense and Interior Committee of Parliament to say such disparaging things, such irresponsible things is what I can't seem to wrap my mind around. And that is worrying. Mm. And I'm hoping that the uh, leadership of Parliament uh, would, would take action this time around because it is becoming one too many. Yeah. Uh, if I were Erastus as I don't go, I would have gone into hiding, but uh, it appears mm. gone into hiding. Um, wait until the dust settles. Um, the police would also have to be quick in providing him uh, security. Mm. Um, some time ago, uh, John, John Lennon of the Beatles was, was shot by an assailant and killed. And you know the excuse the assailant gave? Oh, he had so much love for a celebrity. I think Julia Roberts or something like that. And he wanted to impress her by killing <laughs> a big celebrity, you know. So if, if people can, you know, take drastic steps mm. based on very petty things such as that, then you can imagine well. if you sit on radio and TV and talk about somebody getting uh, beaten messlessly. Right. I mean, so obviously he needs, he needs protection from your perspective very well. Let me move to Mr. Bombande quickly. Mr. Bombande. Yes. Good. So, now this is, a, this is an, uh, a member of parliament He's not just a member of parliament, but actually serves as a chairperson of the uh, Interior and Defense Committee in parliament. How much of a worry is that, given that position he is in and the kind of comments he's made currently and tracing back to you know, previous times? What, 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 what do you make of that? So let me follow from the observations of my brother Habib mm. and compliment uh, his analysis. And uh, I'll, I'll do this by trying to look at it at two levels. So I want to look at it at the level of the actions of the individual and then look at it at the level of the individual himself. So first of all, we all agree that his actions, which are the threats, and thank you for giving us a timeline mm. that makes reference, not just of the recent threat against journalist uh, Erastus uh, Asare Donko, mm. but of other incidences <laughs> of deviant behavior. Right. Now, if you uh, look at those threats, number one, they are abhorrent, they are appalling, and it's an indictment on Ghana as a whole and Ghana's democracy. And that relates to the question you are asking about his rule, yeah. which I will, I will come to. Now, his rule as a member of parliament so let me let me begin by saying that uh, you have I've, 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 I've worked with you I've, I've met you and I've known you for some years at uh, media general you are not a member of parliament but your public role as a journalist automatically moderates your behavior when you are in public 
precisely because you are a public figure. Now, a public figure does not necessarily mean the position you hold, mm -hmm. but it's about how your role and your work should constantly be a role model for others. So that as we build a society and as a nation, the type of social cohesion and harmony we want is seen through the lenses of people who interact publicly. Hmm. So I'm sitting with you, Habib is sitting with you. I have been in a public role, but ever since I have left government, I cannot say that because I'm no longer in government, I can behave in a way that can be irresponsible and get away with it. Hmm. How much more if we are referring to somebody who is not just a member of parliament, but he's well publicly exposed. He's well known as a wealthy businessman. Before then, you look at him as a member of parliament. But beyond that, he has served on a committee as the chair for communication, and yeah. now currently the committee on defense and interior. If you give this background, as I have done quickly, the more you are publicly exposed in terms of your roles, the more the responsibility is on you. Now, in his current role, he should be providing oversight to the executive in how the security agencies are conducting themselves. So what we should have actually been seeing is his questions about the role of the police and the military in a jura. But he has rather gone ahead of himself to attack and threaten journalists who are simply doing their work. So the first comment we must make, and we must make this very strongly, is that at all times, not some of the time, public behavior from individuals in their various roles must contribute to the safety and security of the media and media personnel mm -hmm. in order that they are able to do their work and to do their work efficiently. Why is this important? Because the media is the watchdog that holds everybody accountable, whether in public life or even in some cases in private life. If you threaten the media, you prevent them from their watchdog rule, then there is a double jeopardy. Because then you prevent them from holding accountable. People must be held accountable. And so the human rights abuses that then come along is precisely because the role of the media would be inhibited. And to that extent, therefore, we can see why uh, there is an overwhelming public, uh, 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 what I would call anger mm. about uh, his particular trait. But I, I need to then add on that, that the responsibility that comes with various rules equally mean that when you have consistently violated the type of respect that the office brings to you, then you must be held accountable. And so my second comment is this. Very well. Carry on, please. My, yes. So my second uh, comment is, is it not true that part of the reason why Honorable Kenya Japan has done and repeatedly threatened people in one way or the other is because there is a polarized, there's, let me describe it as an extreme polarized political environment that he takes advantage of. And so when we're talking about accountability, I would wish that it should not be seen as NDC holding Honorable Kennedy at Japan accountable because he's an opponent to NDC. It must be the collective role of responsibility of all members of parliament. No. And I would even go further to say that his own party should take the lead in playing that role of holding him accountable. Mm. But having said this... But let me bring in I, something here, which has to do with the bit about accountability by the collective. Um, I yes. believe the latest news regarding this issue is that uh, the Honorable Kennedy Japan has literally, or uh, if you like, practically uh, rubbished his referral to the Privileges Committee of Parliament, which, you know, is mandated to look into such matters. Plus, 
the majority side is also considering, you know, having this matter dealt with outside that privileges committee arrangement. So, yes, you're talking about systems, institutions that would necessarily yeah. ensure some accountability. But here we are with this kind of situation. So the question then is what do what even becomes of the systems that we ourselves have agreed to put in place to help deal with such matters when uh, they do pop up? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy you make reference to to systems that we try to put in place, mm -hmm. democratic system that function for our collective good, all of us. Now, when you undermine that system by refusing to exercise the responsibility on you to hold accountable those who try to destroy the system, you are not doing damage just because the person belongs to your political divide, but you do damage for the entire country particularly in terms of the future and how the system then becomes resilient and, 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 and can function. And that's why collectively working to hold him responsible is not necessarily a punishment of Honorable Kirinia Japan, but it is precisely to make strong the system that uh, you are just uh, describing. Mm. However, if Honorable Kirinia Japan, and I also want to add, he seems to be a man who is struggling with himself. He seems to be a man who does not know what he wants. He has family, and through social media, he tries to project himself as a responsible father. He is wealthy, he has political influence, he has political power, but it looks like all that is empty for him. And he projects himself always negatively in the public eye. Now, if he is able to manage his own ego, recognize his own weaknesses, mm. and be prepared to engage differently into the future in terms of behavior and conduct, I can then hear or listen to the proposal that you made that some people from his political side, which is the majority, think that they can deal with it outside. Mm. Because dealing with it outside means the person has expressed remorse, is regretting, and is willing to change, and is prepared to contribute to the development of the system that you just talked about. Right, but unfortunately, but in this instance, this person has actually rubbished his referral to the Privileges Committee. I mean, it's, obviously, he's not above the law. Definitely exactly. not. Nobody is above the law. So what do you make of that particular uh, you know, action of his, literally... Um, disregarding uh, his referral to the um, Privileges Committee of Parliament. So in terms of our internal collective security arrangement, democratic accountability, deepening and consolidating de democracy, which we can list as informing that system. And I like the uh, description you made, because I'll, I like to do a lot of system analysis, mm. which basically looks at the interconnection of everything. Right. We can as well forget about it, precisely because when some people see themselves and are treated as above the law, then no system operates. Mm -hmm. And we have to borrow again from South Africa that a former president has to be subjected to the democratic system of South Africa. Right. He's currently in jail. Mm -hmm. The worst mistake would have been for mm -hmm. Jacob Zuma to have been treated mm -hmm. differently because he was a former president. In the same scenario, if Kennedy Japan cannot be held accountable because of who he is, then how do you hold anybody accountable, regardless of the status of that person? Right. And that's why this is grievous, and it's a serious concern going forward in our Ghanaian dispensation. Mm. But my good sister, let me uh, uh, conclude my contribution at, uh, on this question by saying that. Sure. Those who are not doing a deep and introspective analysis do not know the damage mm. that this continues to do to our democracy when we allow these things to just pass on without the level of seriousness that uh, they, they, they have to be dealt with. And I would even have thought that it should be the MPP that should take the leadership in trying to engage Honorable Kevin Japan and to hold him accountable to his actions. Mm. And since he has demonstrated publicly that he's rubbishing any of the attempts to hold him accountable, his own party should be stronger. So that it does not look like this is politics mm. and it's the divide between the two 
uh, 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 parties in which it is the NDC who should hold him accountable. Yeah. And obviously, finally, he's not cut out and he does not have the temperament to play the role he's playing currently as the chair of the Defense and Interior Committee of Parliament. Because well, there is an indictment <coughs> to the entire parliamentary system. Exactly so. Very well. Let me quickly also move to um, Adib. And, and let me, let me yes, Adib, come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, that, 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 that I, I, I couldn't have agreed with uh, Mr. Bombandi more. Um, uh, Honorable Kennedy, Japan's continuous protection, okay, as it seems, by his side, is emboldening him. Um, yesterday, I listened to his rebuttal over him being all to the Privileges Committee, and he even said worse things. As a matter of fact, he got into the gutter. He, he, he sounded very dirty. I mean, he virtually insulted uh, Honorable Alassane uh, Suhini and repeated the same things he said about the journalists beaten and the fact that multimedia is, is, is was established uh, using drug money and all that. I mean, mm -mm. that is disturbing. And um, as a chairman of the Defense and Interior, I mean, uh, and also intelligence, um, he will be privy to a lot of information, yep. um, some of it. Uh, in one way or the other would be uh, classified and as uh, I don't want to use an un unpalatable description but as someone who is not able to hold back his words he says it almost everything he gives you a thousand cities then the following day he's on TV telling the whole world he's giving you a thousand cities I mean so I can imagine uh, what <coughs> secrets he can hold back you know, and that would be disturbing. And as someone, like rightly mentioned by Mr. Bumpande, who would exercise oversight responsibility and all that, um, the, 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 the security of the state is paramount. And his continuous language, because I remember prior to the 2016 elections, he said that if uh, Charlotte or say uh, uh, Ricks, or, or compromises the elections, there will be war in Ghana. I mean, that, that is what he said. And his utterances about the media and also in the wake of attacks against the media and all that is not making us fare well. I mean, we are not doing well at all on the you know global uh, press uh, uh, freedom index. Uh, for some years now, uh, our fortunes has been dwindling and all of it is as a result of uh, issues like this. Mm. Our inaction, uh, uh, would mean acceptance uh, of the status quo, which I must say uh, infringes on, on the, the democratic uh, values that we so much uh, uh, protect. Right. Very well. And we will be looking at the general environment within which, you know, uh, journalists or media practitioners operate in Ghana. But just as, I mean, we, we, let's wrap up on the specifics uh, regarding um, Honorable Kennedy Japan. Let me come to you, um, Mr. Bombande. I mean, you have worked in international circles and all of that. So let me see how you see this statement of his. You know, when you listen to him in the um, video, he tries to draw a link uh, traces, you know, or goes back to some historical context of Rwanda and the genocide that came out of Rwanda decades ago. Some have said that he made that statement within a context. Do you think there's any justification in that? People trying to suggest that, well, you know, he was only cautioning uh, media practitioners to be circumspect in their reportage and all, particularly when he tries to tie it or link it to the genocide of Rwanda. Mr. Bombande. So let me, let me respond to you by uh, uh, putting it this way. Mm. Have you noticed that in the, in the trend analysis, if you go to the timeline that you yourself shared at mm -hmm. the beginning of the program, his outrageous language and attack on people often happens in his own television studio where he's the paymaster of the journalists who interview him overwhelmingly. That is the case. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is happening? Because in his own studio, none of the journalists there can challenge him and can challenge him on his utterances. So then they are spineless and they are just like, uh, excuse my language, objects that he uses and plays around with them to get his language across. If you can then 
put him in a situation as the two of us are with you uh, in your studio. If he were with you in your studio, he knows that you will not allow him to get away with some of the language that he uses. So he won't come to you in your studio for an interview. And that should tell us a lot. Mm. That should tell us how the system is feeling, in which the, the media space mm -hmm. has been taken and has been misused for the purposes of extreme ideological projection of the influence and the power of an individual. And that's what happened to Rwanda. Right. The, the media in itself was not the, 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 the reason for the genocide. Yeah. It's how powerful political players who were completely trapped in ethnocentric policy, politics. And that ethnocentric politics went to the extreme level of trying to eliminate the opponent who was from a different ethnic group. Media now became an instrument, mm. a tool for that genocidal mm. agenda. Right. And that's how it came to pass. That Radio New Collins was able to play the role and functions that we saw. Now, you then go back to the practice then of the media space. We want in order to continue to develop our freedoms and liberties and our democracy. We want an, an active media landscape in which our journalists would report everything that they see, everything that is happening, so that the generality of the public can be well informed to contribute to the decision-making processes that continues to advance Ghana. Mm. When you, when you intimidate that media space and prevent the media from doing that, then the consequences are great. Mm. And now if I relate it to the other aspect of your question, keep in mind that when you review the literature of international human rights law, what is cross-cutting, what you see as elements is that the more responsibility you hold in society, the more the human rights charter the covenant on political and civil rights all set people accountable in their actions that violate media freedoms. So in other words, if I were to put it differently, if an individual in private life were to make a comment against the media, the way it will be treated will be different from when it is the chair of the Parliamentary Committee on Defense and Interior sure. or a member of parliament sure. or a cabinet minister. And that is why uh, Habib talked about why we are dropping in the uh, uh, Rankings. Uh, index mm. of media freedom, precisely because the very people who should be protecting uh, 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 the, the, the civilians are the ones who, by threatening the media, are violating the rights of the civilians. Right. And to that extent, your, the, your viewers must be able to see the linkage. And it then goes back to say that if you are a serious politician who understands the dynamics of the management of the affairs of the state, all of us must come together, regardless of whether you are active in politics or you are not active in politics, where your political perspectives lie in, to, so that there is mutual accountability and everybody then can operate on the basis of how Ghana continues to advance. Mm. And my good sister, put that and project it in what is uh, ahead of us. Not only are uh, the, the trends in our global economy going down, which will affect all of us, but we are struggling to come out of a pandemic. In other words, political power. Yesterday, I was talking with uh, a, a group of leaders from SADC as they prepare to go to Zambia for elections. And one of the things that came out is that political power has become a center of conflict. There is a conflict gap in which people feel that if they don't have political power, they are doomed to continue to be in misery and in poverty. Yeah. And so the conflicts around political power are increasing. Yeah. Now, the capacity of the state, both informal and formal, to manage how we 
ensure peaceful transitions. We show peaceful elections has become very acute. And when you have political players who are not aware of this in terms of their own analysis and understanding, mm -hmm. then what could be ahead of us as a Republic of Ghana could be grievous and serious. And that is why I'm happy that in your work, you are bringing this to the fore, not because you want us to look at individuals mm -hmm. and unnecessarily criticize them and say they are bad people. That's right. not the issue. Mm -hmm. But you want us to subject all of us to the type of reflection that is introspective mm -hmm. about all of us as Ghana. Right. So that we ask ourselves, what kind of leadership do we need mm -hmm. going forward? Mm -hmm. We need a leadership that understands. And as I speak to you, I'm not exempting myself. If I am irresponsible, if I cannot demonstrate the quality of leadership, then I have no contribution to make to Ghana. I cannot pretend that I have something meaningful to contribute when my behavior and attitude is constantly one of irresponsibility. Mm. Forget about my political role, but look at me then as an individual. And now, if we can all agree on that basis, we can go ahead. Very well. That's why I think this conversation is very, very important for policy making, but also for how we are managing the emerging future, mm. which is probably going to be more difficult right. than the past that we have come from. Very well. Uh, thanks for that. We need to take a break, but indeed you've raised some very important points. You're talking about the ownership of uh, networks within our media space, raising issues about how political power is displaced, is displayed even within that space. A very important point would be interrogating further when we can, because I believe it has implications for how uh, journalists are able to operate uh, freely or otherwise within the media space. I also take some messages that have come through. Um, quick one, uh, this one says, this is Alhaji Hamza in Pickfam. He says, Abna, I salute you this morning. Truth be said, this attitude of harassment by Kennedy Japan in this country is becoming one too many. And um, early, the earlier something is done about it, the better. Kennedy Japan should realize that he's a lawmaker and for that matter, the chairman of the Committee of Interior and Defense in Ghana's parliament. In my humble opinion, the chairmanship of the Interior and Defense Committee should be taken from him because he does not deserve it. Um, Alhaji Haruna in Ashaiman says, Abna, the behavior of Kennedy Japan puts the lives of all journalists in danger and prevents them from doing their job. Um, so, uh, from doing their job, sorry. Um, Kweku in La Paz says, Guman Abna, Ghanaian should not take our peace for granted. Our peace... Um, it's a legacy from Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah uh, by bringing us together. Prince Henry in Koforidia says, Guman Nabna, first it was Ahmed Swale and he was killed some days after the threat was issued. Now, same threat is issued on Erastus. Should we wait for him to be killed like Ahmed Swale before we act? Ghana police, your integrity is in limbo. The future is pregnant indeed. Hashtag the key points. I'll take one more. Says Aziz, This is Aziz Donla in Wa. He says, the insecurity in the country is alarming and worrisome. Indeed, as citizens, we all have to personally safeguard our own security because the current development is becoming whimsical and capricious. Hashtag fix the country now. That's Aziz Donla in Wa. Thanks. I will be reading some more of your messages when we return from the break. This is the key points. Uh, we'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll continue our discussion looking at... Uh, attacks on journalists and how to stem the tide of attacks. See you shortly. Welcome back. You're still watching and listening to The Key Points live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7, online at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page at TV3 Ghana. So we're continuing with the conversation here. We're looking at attacks on journalists, uh, particularly looking at what happened recently uh, with some statements coming from uh, Honorable Kennedy of Japan in respect of multimedia group journalist Erastus Asari Donko. Statements made by uh, the Honorable uh, Kennedy of Japan have obviously been condemned by many, uh, talking about practitioners within the media fraternity and indeed several other quarters have you know, actually condemned these statements and that's currently what we're looking at. 
Um, we are honing in on uh, the Canadian Japan statements, but obviously we're looking at the bigger context of attacks on journalists, and that's what we are currently engaging here. Um, joining me in the studio now is um, Felix Kwachi Ofosu. He is the former Deputy Minister of, Inform of Information under the uh, Joint Roman Muhammad Administration. You're welcome. It's good to Thank have you. you. And um, also on Zoom, we still have um, the Honorable, sorry, Mr. Bombande, Imano Bombande, a founding director of the West African Network for Peace Building, and he is also a UN senior mediation advisor. Um, it's good to have you. Um, I'm told, um, Honorable, that you're former deputy minister for communication, not information. Yes. No, I actually used to be deputy minister for information. Information. Before it became communication. Became communication. Very well. So, okay, so good. The designation so, is accurate. It's not very well. Accurate, okay. Yeah. It's good to have you. So, so yes. Um, well, we've had some communications prior to sure. your coming here, and sure. so we'll, we'll I'll definitely give you that opportunity to sure. also, you know, give your um, reaction to the statements in perspective now, Honorable Kennedy Japan's statements regarding Erastus Asaridonko, um, threats against the journalists, and um, a whole lot of issues um, coming from that quarter. Your thoughts on that? Well, thank you, Abina. Um, to begin with, I am a stickler for free speech. Mm. So I will be the last person to seek to care Free anybody's speech rights. Responsibility Absolutely. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'm just developing the purpose. Sure. So I'll be the very last person to advocate for curbs on anybody's mm. right to express himself. Mm. Now, I think we all know that Mr. Ejapon styles himself as some sort of anti-establishment figure who rails against the system at every opportunity that he gets. Mm. But you see, there's a minimum standard of acceptable behavior for all public figures, which nobody can breach, mm. even if you are an anti-establishment figure. Unfortunately, Mr. Japan has breached this standard of behavior on multiple locations without any consequence. He has run roughshod over any and everybody in this country and any and every institution that one can think of without any consequence. But I don't think that we can pretend that we do not know why the situation persists. And Abna, let me begin by putting you in the media on the spot. You see, unlike many other sections of society, you in the media have far more capacity to wage your own campaign and speak for yourself than any other group or entity that I am aware of. You have such power as to call out wrongdoing and misconduct to put people who are errant in check than any other seg segment of society. So I cannot imagine how the media and media personalities allow themselves to fall prey to Mr. Japan's misconduct over the period. And I'll give you an example. Twitter, new media, social media. They had the capacity to take on the president of the United States of America. When he made statements that they deemed inappropriate, they actually yanked him off that network. Recently, they applied similar measures to the president of Nigeria. Of course, it generated all manner of mm. controversy. But at least they took the action and sent a clear signal that they were not going to countenance any breach of the acceptable standard of behavior that all of us are subject to. But it seems that's the peculiar thing with Honorable Kennedy Chapel. He has his own. No, no, but you say, no, no, I'm not. And that, he goes that, on that, is that's not the all issue. That, he does. that is not the issue. There's little you can do about his ownership of that mm -hmm. station. However, the rest of you can band together and isolate him such that he does not get any oxygen to express those sentiments outside of that niche that he has. Mm -hmm. At the very least, it will limit his ability to spread this kind of hate speech and language. Indeed, I, I stand to be corrected, but I'm yet to hear even the Ghana Journalist Association intervene in this matter. Oh, they have. Well, together well, with Kiba, Prince Thanks, Pat, thanks, for, yes, the correction. thanks for the correction. Mm -hmm. But at least, what, what, what would it take for all of you, media houses in Ghana, to, in solidarity with your colleague, Erastus Asaridonko, decide that you have issued a blackout on Kenya Japan on your network, so that he is not to appear on any network apart from his own. If you took that step, it will send such a strong signal to him and all those who support his misconduct and misbehavior that you are taking exception to the misbehavior. But I have not seen that happen. Indeed, there are some who actually seek to defend his conduct against their own colleague who has come under attack. So the media, in my view, cannot escape blame or scrutiny when we come to analyze what has resulted in this. The other entity that needs to be blamed is Mr. Ejapon's party. You see, political parties are not public organizations, but they are public interest organizations because of the way that we operate. 
Mr. Japon belongs to the political party. And political parties, like I indicated, to the extent that they are in the public eye, are also bound by acceptable standards of public behavior. So when one member constantly behaves errantly, without consequence, sometimes with the active support and connivance of his party, that party must be called out. Indeed, I'll give you a typical example. Mr. Japon has said many things, but in my view, the most outrageous of them was what he said in 2011, uh, calling on accounts to attack Grand Service. You remember that outrageous call? To everybody's utter dismay, rather than call him out, his party gave him absolute support. Indeed, they carried him shoulder high, poured powder on him when the courts cleared him of wrongdoing. And of course, we disagreed violently with the court's ruling. But that is, there was nothing that we could do about it because the court had. But the party did not show opprobrium or any angst at all about his behavior. They carried him shoulder high and made him a hero. But the court had ruled. True. But nobody can dispute the fact that what he said was outrageous and completely unacceptable. His MPP party gave him support. And the people of Ghana also appear to accept that conduct by not punishing that party and calling them out. If we did that, the party will bring pressure to bear on At least they will rein him in. Mm. If indeed it is impossible to rein him, to rein him in, they will expel him as an example of their intent to maintain the decency that we all expect on the part of all public officials and politicians. The other entity that I must criticize is Parliament itself. Mm. You see, the title honourable is not given to members of Parliament because Parliament has a storehouse of titles to confer as confetti. It comes with great responsibility. It means that your conduct must reflect the title and status that you are accorded in Ghanaian society. Yeah. Mr. Japan has done this multiple times. Indeed, parliament does not require anybody to petition them to take action against Mr. Japan. He's their own rules. To the privileges committee, indeed, but until, you know very, until very recent. Indeed, yeah. there's an earlier report that was made to the Privileges Committee that yielded nothing. Mm. And it created the impression that parliament was unconcerned about his persistent misconduct. A few days ago, Honorable Sunini, and I salute him for having the boldness and courage to stand up to this sort of misconduct. I do hope that this time round, Parliament shows the level of seriousness that we expect of them. They must rein in their own errant member. Are more you, than are, any you, are you optimistic? Well, on the evidence of what you've seen, I'm not optimistic, mm. regrettably. But I, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt and see whether they will do something good by the people of Ghana so mm. that we, we see that they take these matters seriously. We cannot allow anybody to get away with it. The other institution or group of institutions that I need to call out are the police and our courts. Abna, the police themselves have been at the receiving end of very disparaging remarks from Kennedy Japan. Sometimes he makes wild, outrageous allegations against them. One of them was that recently the police revealed to him the identity of the person that killed uh, Ahmed Swali. To date, we've not had any proper denial or confirmation of that particular claim. They've not even made the effort to invite Mr. Japan for questioning on that claim. Indeed, all the statements that he's made, the, the threats that he issued against uh, Erasmus Asadonko constitutes a crime. You are the lawyer, so I'm sure you know. What he did against Ahmed Swali, publishing his photograph and exposing him to public danger and calling on people to attack him and saying that he will pay for any fallouts of that particular attack constituted a crime. Yet the police did nothing. We are talking about the police, and if you like, a justice delivery system that has picked up the NDC chairman and put him on trial because he is alleged to have whispered something in a secret meeting. This time, somebody sits on public television without restraint and issues threats against the lives of media practitioners, and the police does absolutely nothing. Then there is the courts. Abna, not too long ago, I think last year, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Japan went on a tirade against a judge, used appalling language on a judge. In times past, the Association of Magistrates and Judges, I hope that I got the designation right, mm -hmm. would be up in arms. I recall that when the former NDC chairman, Mr. Kwabneji, the late Kwabneji, Dr. Kwabneji, said that there are multiple ways of killing a cat, an idiomatic expression that we all use in everyday expression. The Association of Magistrates and Judges issued a statement condemning him. The Ghana Bar Association issued a statement condemning him. Mr. Japan poured appalling language and scorn 
on a judge. And yet, we saw what was clear and manifestly an attempt to extricate him. Indeed, I hear that that matter has been determined. Many people are under the impression that it has not been determined. The matter has been determined. Apparently, he got off with a warning. It's been determined? Yes. As far as we know, it was supposed to go yes, back I hear that, to the AGs. But you can, you can check. The you AGs. Can, I, I, I haven't heard that. You can check. I heard recently that the matter apparently has been determined. He got off Very with a warning. If it is not the case, I stand to be corrected. Right. And I will... Uh, uh, Please be wrapping willing, up for me so yeah. I quickly get in uh, Mr. Mr. Japan has not faced any consequence mm. for doing that. Yet we were in this country when four young men who do not have the sort of responsibility that Mr. Japan has by virtue of their, his position, disparage judges. They got a hefty four months jail term and very heavy fines. It shows that the judiciary took exception to their conduct. And yet a member of parliament is able to do this to a judge, disrespect him in the most appalling way. And he faces no consequence. He walks free. Now, when these things happen, what can we possibly expect? Do we expect Mr. Japan to amend his ways? Or we expect him to continue to denigrate and disparage institutions and individuals and issue threats in the manner that he's doing? Mm. So I quite frankly get surprised when we come and express surprise that Mr. Japan has done it again. One of our problems as a country is that we do not want to do what has to be done right. in order to check misconduct. Mm -hmm. If we woke up as a country and made it clear that you cannot do some things mm. and that if you did some things there was the certainty of punishment sure. or that the society will come down very hard on you there was no way there's no way that mr japan will continue indeed look yeah. at look at the irony abna as we sit here mr japan is leading parliament's select committee on defense and interior to go to war to investigate the disturbances that took place involving the military meanwhile the very thing that he is going to investigate is something that he is instigating others to do I don't see how Parliament found it fit to make somebody like that the chairperson of such a vital committee in Parliament. Mm. So the things we do are completely at variance with the views that we express. They're reinforcing. We, we need to put our hands uh, uh, where our mouths are, our money where our mouths mm -hmm. are. I beg your pardon, because you cannot do things Very one well. way and expect, expect a certain things. outcome. Very well. We have capacity as a country, as a society, to mm. reign in Mr. Japan. We simply have failed to do so. Mm. From the media, to his party, to parliament, to police, to the courts, and mm. members of the general public. Isolate him. Let him be able to do that thing on his station alone and see whether he'll get the mileage that he gets. But don't Very be surprised well. if from tomorrow, media organizations still invite him Very well. to we, comment on national issues. That, that's exactly a point I want us to interrogate on, you interrogate further. Even before the break, I had indicated that. Because, Mr. Bombandi, you raised the issue about proliferation of the media space, but particularly looking at the ownership. So, yes, there's that proliferation, you know, um, giving room for employment of people and all of that. But there's the other side of it, which has to do with political power and how it is at play in there to the detriment of society, given how it is being exercised. And that's what I want us to take, you know, take the discussion to now, to ensure that even as the media space is being you know, expanded, if you like, taking uh, information to the people as close as possible, there's a certain danger in there. And that has to do with uh, the protection of journalists as they carry on their business. How are we to look at this? Example here, Mr. Canadian Japan has his media station. Yes, he may be blacked out on other stations or other networks, but he still has his. He has some uh, level of you know, substantial followership or viewership. What is to be done? Well, first of all, uh, let me appreciate the continuation of this conversation and the brilliant submissions by my good uh, uh, younger brother, uh, Felix Ofusukwachi, and to be able to situate this in some of the references that he made. Mm -hmm. Maybe to respond to your, your question, if we want to deepen and consolidate our democracy with the type of systems that are transparent to deliver justice to all manner of persons with equity and without any forms of discrimination, we need to look at media ownership and what it means to be able to ensure that media contributes precisely to this uh, consolidation of uh, demo democracy and democratic practice. Now, if you uh, take a step back to one of the references, maybe we need to look at the possibility of legislation 
that holds people accountable for hate speech. Because the, the worst hate speech in Ghana that has ever been made is the 2011 reference that Felix uh, uh, alluded to in mm -hmm. our conversation. Uh, a can should hit the heads of uh, guns or airways and etc. And again, it shows how somebody who owns a media house can use it to perpetuate division, hatred, and resentment, and yet get away with it. Because that could have led to the magnitude of, of, of killings uh, that could be unprecedented. But having uh, made this uh, 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 observation, what you begin to see consistently is that the ownership of media has since degenerated in terms of how ownership well, first of all, let me say that there's a caveat. We cannot make that generalization. Mm -hmm. But then we can say that in the context of this conversation of Honorable Kenya Japan, he has definitely used the media to influence negatively his own character and, 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 and projections mm -hmm. that uh, we, 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 we are talking about. But curiously enough, his media house that he made those statements which are categorized or are included at his speech, continues to function. But a media house that was very popular like Radio Gold, mm -hmm. for very mysterious circumstances, when there was a change of government, has been shut down together with others. And as we speak, that media house, at least in terms of its frequency, has been prevented from operating. And those who have the influence and the power to take away that frequency also have an interest and investment in a new media house that then emerged. So not only is the media ownership beginning to be problematic, but it is being used discriminately to project political power and to have total control of political power, which then becomes an underlying issue that can send us into very deep, violent conflict. And we need to be able to uh, address this. Mm -hmm. Because if we do not do it, we are just simply joining the hypocrisy that everything looks good in Ghana because we are burying our heads in the sand right. and then thinking that uh, everything in, uh, uh, seems to, to be in order. Right. If you then put this against the background of the accusations, it then goes back to one, if you want to end impunity, you must hold people who consistently abuse the media landscape and use it in the ways that we are talking about, you must sanction them in order that uh, everybody can see that the state has the capacity to hold such people accountable. Mm. And that in itself is the means through which we can end the impunity. If at the level of the police, at the level of the judiciary, at the level of parliament itself, we are spineless, and none of this can happen. Then let's also agree that we are preparing ourselves for the worst case scenario. And when we get there, nobody should then turn around and pretend that we do not know what was ahead of us mm. or what was uh, 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 going to come. So, mm. And that for me, then becomes uh, very significant. Very, very, very well. Um, Mr. Mubande, sorry, let me uh, just interrupt there a bit. Uh, I think. We've been joined by uh, Richard Asante Yaboa, Deputy Communications Director of the NPP. And let me say that indeed we had advertised that we'll be joined by um, Dr. John Kuma, the Deputy uh, Finance, a uh, Deputy Finance uh, <coughs> Minister, but he didn't join us as uh, advertised. And so we now have a representation from uh, the NPP. That's Richard Asante Yaboa, Deputy Communications Director of the NPP. Good morning, Richard. How are you? Good morning, my dear. I'm doing good, man. I hope I'll show with you, and good morning to my, my colleagues out there. Good. So, yes, uh, I'm sure you've been following the conversation here. We're looking at uh, the statements made by the Honorable Kennedy in Japan in respect of Erastus Asari Donko, uh, and uh, we're looking at that within the context of, you know, earlier statements or similar statements that he'd made in the past, and we're trying to understand why it is that, you know, these things continue to occur. Um, a number of issues have come up talking about the fact that perhaps because we haven't seen any, necessar any sanctions being meted out necessarily in respect of the Honorable Kennedy Japan, so perhaps that's why such conduct has been reinforced over the period. Your party has been called into question why you haven't been able to rein him in. Let me hear you on this. 
Uh, <laughs> Unless you're saying the NPP uh, endorses I, such statements. Very difficult for. Uh, I think first and foremost, uh, I would want to say that uh, Honourable Candidate Japan is an adult and uh, the Member of Parliament and whatever he speaks and he ought to be uh, uh, held responsible for whatever comes out of his mouth. And we need to understand that within the context of free speech, one also ought to be careful with the term where the person will not speak to him that will create challenges for us. But I think everything came in as a result of the media conduct and the reportage that we saw from the Adria incident, where the conduct of the media and the conduct of certain individuals wanted to profit from the unfortunate death of Qatar. Uh, when they are not even fully aware of the incident that led to the death of the gentleman, decided to take advantage of that issue where they, uh, they, they link the individual to the first of the country movement as a result created some anger within the youth that led to the unfortunate death and avoided with the of two Ghanaians because of the reportage and the, 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 the sort of media creation and certain individuals who decided to sort of uh, profit from this for their own private career in an agenda. But that is yet to be determined, correct? Is yet to be determined by the committee. Thing. That, that connection you're making is yet to be but established. But I think the first time I think I'm talking about the committee will speak, but as Ghanaians and as the issues are unfolding. Too bad. Uh, we're having a difficult time uh, staying connected with Richard. Richard, yeah, we are having a tough time with your connection. Um, nah, I think we'll, we'll, we'll try to perhaps raise you on phone. But let's see if we have um, Adib. Adib, are you there? I'm there. Great. OK, I'm so there. yes, um, you heard uh, Felix Kwachofosu's for statements and all of that. And um, if you have any reaction to that, that, let's hear it. But also, let's touch on this, that, that the police have responded to the multimedia complaint. They have indicated there that they are making, uh, they are taking, uh, giving it the attention it deserves, and that they are sure the public that they are aware and alive to our, their constitutional mandate and responsibility. Against the backdrop of what we've seen in the past regarding how you know, matters like this have been treated, how optimistic are you about um, this uh, issue moving forward, the complaint lodged with the police? Well, well it is refreshing to um, see the statement from the police. As a matter of fact, it is within the uh, mandate of the police to uh, uh, preempt and uh, 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 prevent crime from happening. It is within their mandate to ensure that uh, basically you and I are able to go to bed with our two eyes closed that night. Um, it, they have to take immediate uh, steps to ensure uh, security for the gentleman because in the past I think uh, we let our guards down. Um, we downplayed the seriousness of some of these threats. Uh, you remember some time ago uh, there was this video that went viral on social media. Uh, it was about a pastor, a Ghanaian pastor based in the U.S., threatening his wife mm. uh, that if he doesn't kill her, the brother should call him fake. And and in the end, what happened? He, he killed her. So I mean, threats cannot be taken uh, lightly. Um, but that notwithstanding, overall, I think in the midst of all of these discussions, um, one thing is worth uh, paying attention to. That is building institutional capacity to sanitize uh, the airwaves. I mean, they say that media is a double-edged sword. I mean, it can be used for good. Uh, it can be used for bad as well. And uh, it's particularly disturbing in recent times um, once I mean, rich people or wealthy businessmen are able to open media houses. and. The problem is we have the institutions to ensure that the media landscape, you know, is sanitized. Mm -hmm. But the biggest threat, the biggest threat is the seeming over politicization of these, you know, regulators right. uh, <laughs> like the NCA, the, the uh, 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 that I, I, I actually 
We even have uh, civil society playing uh, a major role now because it looks more like we cannot completely uh, trust the, 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 these, these regulators to do a good work. Uh, so we have foundations such as the Media Foundation for West Africa coming out with their periodic reports on the use of uh, intemperate languages on um, uh, the, the media. But overall, I think that uh, these institutions have a very important role to play, but that can only be realized if we detach the politics mm. from it. And earlier, uh, Mr. Bombardi said something that I found captivating. Uh, that is the issue of politics and how it has permeated through the society to the extent that, from my opinion, um, uh, you see a, a, a black sheep, you would be forced to say it is white because of your political inclinations. Sometimes when things happen on social media, for example, someone someone losing an eye, uh, the first question that is asked is, is he NBC or MPP? <laughs> Once it is your party, yeah. your position, your perception, your opinions is different if it is uh, from, from the other side. So I think that is worrying. And this, even though it's sad, should present to us a unique opportunity to look at the legislations, especially on hate speech. So we are able to deal with this once and for all. But if the legislations exist without uh, implementation or exactly. enforcement, then yet another uh, sure. law on FIFA which, which would do nothing or amount to nothing. Very well. Thank you for that, Adib. Uh, Felix, quick yeah. point though. Um, too bad we couldn't hear um, Richard all through, but at least he indicated that, you know, there was a connection between the kind of reportage that was put out and the subsequent action um, by um, Honorable Kennedy Japan, trying to establish, you know, it's connect the all, two. What do you make of that? Is it, as in respect of the Israel? Yeah, exactly. Is it first of all, uh, let me say hello to Richard. I know that Richard is, a, is an extremely well-behaved and moderate uh, politician, a member of the NP. Mm. I'm a bit surprised at the effort to justify Mr. Japan's statement. First of all, I disagree entirely with the notion that the media has any role to play or had any role to play at all. Uh, in the fomenting of disturbances in Nigeria. But that is not the subject for discussion. Mm -hmm. Indeed, the media only covered what had happened in Nigeria. But, but that is yet to be determined whether yes, or not that. Absolutely. Because but indeed, if something happened to there's a responsibility. No, but no, the no, the point I make is I disagree mm -hmm. because we have sure. all followed it. I disagree mm -hmm. strenuously with all those who have sought to shift blame on the Nigeria disturbances right. onto the media. But that is a, a conversation we can have later. But I'm not assuming without admitting that even Erastus, as I don't call, aired in any way, shape, mm -hmm. or form in his reportage over the Idria matter. It does not lie in the mouth of Kennedy Japan to call on people to assault him. Mm -hmm. That cannot be acceptable. So it should not be cited in the first place as a defense right. for what Kennedy Japan did. So I'm quite surprised that my friend Richard would lend himself to this kind of narrative. It is a dubious narrative, and it is not one that we must accept. Mm. Nobody has a right to constitute himself into a judge and pronounce judgment and punishment on anybody for perceived wrongdoing. Right. If Erasmus as I don't call Ed, there's a commission of inquiry looking into the matter. There are a plethora of avenues through which he can be dealt with or his professional mm. conduct can be called into question. Right. So that, in my view, cannot be cited as reason for Ken Japan's conduct. Very because well. we all know that he has done this over the period and he has not required any Interesting. motivation of the sort <laughs> that has happened in Nigeria today. This is uh, Sorry, uh, Abraham. Mm -hmm. The point I made earlier about the need for state institutions to intervene mm -hmm. is that there is best practice elsewhere. Sure. In February this year, the U.S. Congress, they removed a Republican Congresswoman, Marjorie Taylor, from a number of committees because of comments she made in support of Donald Trump. Mm. And some of those people who voted for her to be removed were Republican congressmen. Right. They did not show their behind party lines right. and allow her behavior to go. The final point, Mr. Yes. Bomade raised the issue of regulation. Mm. Look, it is not beyond. I was a deputy minister for communication. So I know that it is not beyond the capacity of regulatory bodies like the NCO or NMC to take action in respect of what Kenya Japan is doing. Right. If the, you see, I do not have a problem with political ownership of media houses. Mm. That is not a problem. Because there are many political individuals sure. or politicians who own media houses who are operating responsibly. That's a way and, in tandem, sure. and in tandem with our laws, rules, yeah. and regulations. So a blanket 
ban sure. on that would affect innocent people. Definitely. But let us no, isolate wrongdoers exactly. and prescribe appropriate sanctions for them. That for me let the law work will be the greatest it. deterrent very well. rather than seeking to box everybody together. Let me quickly together. get yeah. to uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Bombande. Mr. Bombande will be leaving us very soon. So sure. let me get to him for his concluding remarks. Mr. Bombande, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great, yes. So uh, concluding remarks, any word of advice moving forward, what to do to, you know, uh, media practitioners, institutions that are mandated to, you know, keep the space uh, sanitized and all of that, briefly? Uh, very quickly, uh, my first observation would be that I don't want a situation in which a, a journalist is covering an event and having second doubts as to whether her work or his work can be viewed by some personalities to be correct or not. Because if we get to that level, we bring harm to us in terms of our democratic dispensation and consolidation. Mm. So let the media, let, let the journalists have the space to be able to do their work just like other professions. And that when mistakes are made, they are held accountable by their peers they are held accountable by the, mm. the critique of their work that makes them to improve on the way they work. Right. But not for them to be having second thoughts as to who will judge their work, because then it becomes inhibiting and it limits them. Mm. Second, look at, uh, was it, uh, when we talk about accountability, accountability happens even in a more proper perspective when there is a peer review and accountability. And that's why uh, for our uh, brother Richard, uh, uh, Asante Yeboah, I don't know to what extent he can bring this about. Let me just give an example. Was it Thursday or Friday or yesterday? Two NDC MPs in parliament disagreed on their perspectives about the loan for MPs cars. Uh, Honorable uh, 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 Mutala uh, yeah. Mohammed and Honorable yeah. Ablakwa. But they, are, they belong to the same party. They are in parliament together as NDC MPs. But on a particular issue, they disagree. Now, that for me is the way we should go forward in our democratic practice. We can disagree on issues and yet belong to our political dispensations and continue to develop the democracy of Ghana. Yeah, well. If MPP cannot hold uh, Honorable Kerina at Japan accountable, any comment from NDC then it's interpreted as partisan politics. But it is not about partisan politics. It is the deviant behavior of an individual that is sending all of us down that right. we do not want. And finally, mm. I, I, I agree with the point about the media should be in the forefront of stopping their freedoms and their liberties and their practice from being chipped away constantly by the type of comments that brought us into this conversation. And they can then be supported. And if they are mute, and uh, when media freedoms are being uh, degraded, uh, uh, denigrated and taken away from them, it becomes difficult to uh, pursue and uh, support their matter. But the reason why they refuse to act is because the media has allowed extreme levels of partisanship. And again, let me be careful here and not generalize it. Uh, media general. Uh, multimedia. We know there are media houses doing fantastic work. So let us not make it look like uh, we are generalizing everybody. Very but well. some media houses are not capable of going out of the extreme partisanship and looking uh, in, in, in the way that can deepen and consolidate Ghana's democracy. And that's a problem. Very well. Uh, we have to, you know, bring the conversation to a close, unfortunately. And uh, there's so much to talk about, but mm -hmm. very limited time here. We need to move on to other matters. But let me say a big, big thank you to uh, Mr. Emmanuel Bombande, UN Senior Mediation Advisor, also uh, the founding director of the West African Network for Peace Building, WANEP. We do appreciate your time. Um, also, but Felix... You don't, you don't you don't add, I was a former deputy minister of foreign affairs and uh, regional integration. Very well. You that's don't true. Add that. Very well. Forgive me. <laughs> Forgive me. That's true. Yes, that's true. That's fine. Um, good. So, indeed, you have added that on to, and indeed, that is true. Former uh, Deputy um, Director, sorry, Minister for uh, Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, Mr. Emmanuel Bombande. Also, Felix Kwachio Fosu, former Deputy Minister for Communications. He will be joining us on the next uh, conversation. 
but also thank you to Adib Sani, security analyst, and quite briefly there we had uh, Richard Asante Yabwa join us from the NPP. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we turn our attention to matters concerning um, allowances and or salaries for presidential spouses. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back. You're still watching and listening to The Key Points. We're live on TV3, we're also live on 3FM 92.7, online at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we're moving on next to look at the issue about um, emoluments or salaries and allowances uh, recommended by the Professor Intiamwa Beidu uh, Committee uh, on Emoluments uh, for Presidential Spouses, talking about the first and second ladies. And um, in the studio with me, we still have uh, um, Mr. Felix Kwachu Fosu on Zoom. We also have um, Richard Asante Yabua still with us. And then we have Professor um, Kwesi Ampon Sateria. He's a human resource specialist and the head of the Department of o Organization and Human Resource Management with the University of Ghana Business School. Good morning, gentlemen. It's good to have you um, in studio and on Zoom. Um, so we'll be looking at this, but before that, we have some. Uh, um, Infographics we've put together would like to you know share that as we go along regarding Article 71 office holders, and we have um, here vehicles for Article 71 office holders in 2025. Um, that's 643 cars, members of Parliament. That's 275 justices of the Superior Court. Is 168 uh, ministers and deputies. That's 86. Council of State, we have, that's 81. Uh, Council of State, we have 31. Lands Commission, that's 25. National Council for Higher Education, that's 19. And the National Media Commission, we have 15. Uh, so basically, this is putting together um, some recommendations made. Again, we're going on National Commission for Civic Education, that's seven. Uh, the Public Services Commission, five. Electoral Commission, four. Parliament, Speaker and Deputies, three. The Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Shraj, three as well. And the District uh, Common Fund Administrator, one. The, um, the President, one. And the Vice President, also one. Then there's a request for waiver on MPs' cars. The various uh, waivers there, you have the input duty, import, uh, get fund, levy, Imports NHIL, import VAT, there's Exim levy, there's COVID-19 recovery levy, there's special import levy, ECOWAS levy, as well as the AU levy, uh, inspection fees, withholding tax. Um, that's all under the waiver when it comes to MPs' cars. Now, this uh, is a statement issued by uh, the First Lady, Madame Rebecca Ekufuado. She indicated that the public discussion has been laced with some extremely negative opinions in some cases, which uh, she finds distasteful. Um, and the second lady also indicated that she will refund all allowances paid to her since 2017 and will not accept any monies allocated to her pursuant to the recommendations of the Professor Ya Intiamwa Beidu Committee. The second lady, again, that's uh, indicating what the second lady has uh, indicated, that she will refund all allowances paid to her. Now, this obviously came on the back of uh, the whole bruhaha following uh, the Professor Intiamwa Beidu Committee report that recommended uh, that the first and second ladies be paid salaries pegged at the level of cabinet ministers. Now, I will be moving on to Zoom to speak directly to Professor Kwesi Ampon Sateria. He is coming from the University of Ghana Business School, a human a resource specialist, and to have his take on this. Professor, can you hear me? Yes, please. Good. So, obviously, this conversation has generated a whole lot of, uh, you know, controversy, debates around it. Fundamental here is the question about human resource and how to deal with that. Questions have been raised about why pay salaries to first and second ladies when they have not been assigned any duties, uh, raising the constitutional issue about the, even the appropriateness or otherwise of, you know, a committee set up pursuant to Article 71 
making recommendations about the first or for the first and second ladies who are not named under Article 71. As a human resource specialist following this discussion, um, what are your views? How do you see this going, uh, you know, being resolved? Dean, and thank you very much. Let me take the opportunity also to uh, greet my very good friend, Felix and uh, Richard on the other side. And say that, look, I guess this has been a practice in the country where people are assigned responsibilities without even being given job descriptions and all those bits in our country. And that is the extent to which we've gone bringing it into the broader space and the larger space where we find ourselves in now. We reckon that all well, the services being rendered by the first, uh, how do you call it, the first lady and the second lady in the country, as we all can attest to, quite, quite valuable. If you look at their contribution to the country, quite, quite valuable as well. But hey, here we are now discussing whether indeed they, are, they even have locals to perform such functions in the country. And it does happen. In most public sector organizations, we employ people without even appointment letters and job descriptions and so forth and so on. And this is what is playing out now. It is a truism that, well, yes, these people are, 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 are offering themselves out there to be of support to. If you look at what the First Lady did at Confuanoti, quite super in terms of helping out with the hospital over there and also other activities that she's been engaged in. If you look at what the Second Lady is doing as providing inspiration to the Zongo ladies and providing support, quite, quite, quite good over there. But the question we need to address is, what is the locus? What is their locus? And that is where we should be moving towards in terms of providing clear directions. Do they have any description? Now that we are we be, we be saying that well, whatever uh, allowances they enjoyed in the past was quite illegal and so forth. And what about the offices they've been uh, occupied? What about the staff who work in there? As private citizens that we live, do we have people working for us in our office? No. But that is what is happening now. It is clear, it will recognize that their roles in the country tend to be quite important. Yes, the time has come that we'll have a dispassionate discussion about the roles of first ladies and second ladies and looking at the past, their contribution that it made to the country. If we can streamline activities and clearly assign them on what they should be doing, then we are very much clear and what would go with those bits. Because if you look at what emoluments are, let me talk about emoluments. Emoluments are benefits that are given for services offered in employment. Mm. So who am, uh, offer them the employment? We need to talk about it. Indeed, they are offering services. Who offer that employment for them to offer that service? And what was the conditions of engagement? And I guess that that is where we are getting to. We should look at it from the broader sense of our country, where in our country, people, and I keep emphasizing, people are employed in roles in the organization without even an appointment letter, without job descriptions, and they are drawing salaries, which indeed actually drains the government as well. Mm. I believe that well, I'm not by this saying that well, the first and the second lady uh, they are draining their coin. That's not what I'm implying because well, I can say that mm. well, their contribution largely to the development of the country is something that needs to be commended. Yeah. But then in doing so, we need to streamline activities and make it clear on what their responsibilities are supposed to be given clear directions on what they should be doing. Very well. Uh, you talk about streamlining. We'll be engaging that uh, in momentarily. But let's, let me have your views on this. So following this whole discussion, the first lady, second lady, they've both returned um, the sums that were paid to them since 2017. Um, what do you make of this return of the funds paid to the, or sums paid to them? And do you think that would resolve this whole uh, discussion around uh, whether or not first lady, second lady should even be given um, allowances or salaries? I don't think that it will resolve the issue. I don't think it will resolve because the issue, it is just the salary we are talking about. But hey, we all very much aware that the first lady and the second lady, the first lady and the second lady occupy offices and they have staff who work with them in those offices. Mm. It is very important that we understand that. 
Very well. But what, what's, what's your perspective on the return of the funds? Should they have returned it or they should have kept it? I guess, I guess what actually is happening now is as well, because, the, because of the hula baloo surrounding it in the, as a first step in trying to create some sanity in the system, they decided to return it. But I would have thought that, well, yes, yes, that's, that, that could have uh, indeed be, 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 be held on for some critical look, because at the end of the day, perhaps if a committee is put in place and, and we look at all of these things and we say that, well, yes, it was right that way they were given it and so forth and so on, then we're now going to go back and give it to them. Mm. But I was thinking that, well, Randy, if you return the allowances, and it's not just about the allowances, because well, the occupant office, there are staff, there are people who are working for you and they are being paid as well. What about those things as well? Mm. But that's a question that comes up then, that why do we even set up offices for are the first and second ladies, given the constitution and the fact that there's no um, provision for such offices to be created. Rightly so, and that is why I make the point that all well, it is very important that all well, we take a dispassionate look at this and we try as much as possible recognizing that all well, their roles in the development of the country. I mean, if I if if I cast my mind back and I look at uh, the the first ladies in the past and what they've done, their contribution. I guess that what well, yes we can as a way of supporting their husbands, what well, we can clearly carve out some roles and responsibilities for them and try as much as possible to get them to play that role also to help in the functioning of the presidency as well. So for me, I am very much clear in my mind that, well, yes, it is something that well, we should sit down and begin to have a discussion around it and try and assign them because, well, if you're paying them allowances, if you're paying them salaries, for what are you paying them for? Mm. What job have you given them that you've given them that allowances? Right. And that is where we need to bring clarity to. Sure. Now, you talk about streamlining that. So perhaps, um, you know, what would be your recommendation towards the streamlining you suggest? How do we streamline that? Because we do know that in the past, this has been done under uh, allocations, by, uh, allocations to the office of the president. And now we're told that this was an attempt to formalize it. What would you recommend uh, to be the best way uh, to streamline uh, this whole arrangement? First and foremost, as somebody who is an organizational development specialist, I will indicate that one. Yes, you see, when you talk about change, change is not an event, change is a process. So necessarily, it is important that well, we conscientize the mind of the citizenry about the critical role of the first lady and the second lady in the development of the country. So that is a first step where we have to engage. And in that engagement, where you're bringing on board, yes, uh, uh, stakeholders, and it's important that we have a national discussion around this issue, that well, if our first lady and our second lady are playing critical roles in the development of the economy. What then do we need to do for them to ensure or to enhance their function in the country? Then we can now move on. And I would expect that well, because of the, polari the polarized nature of our country in terms of politics, I would rather would recommend that well, you, you assemble experts to be looking at these things and, and in a much more in a stakeholder engagement, try as much as possible to build consensus around this. And once you've been able to build consensus around this, then we can now put it in a document. If it has to now get into an amendment in our constitution where it features in there, then it can feature in there, then we can have a roadmap of getting it underway. Very well. Now, lastly, um, in the, the first and second ladies in their statements indicating that they had returned the monies paid them since 2017 indicated that, yes, we're returning this, but also we're putting you on notice that we will not be accepting any future allowances. Do you think that is the right course, even as we think of how best to deal with the arrangements? Do you think moving forward they shouldn't even take uh, salaries? Sorry, I'll, allowances. I'll now, I would think that they, they were quite emotive about it. I would say that they were quite emotive about it because I would think that, well, yes, well, once we get to such situations, I believe that, well, we need to remain calm mm. and really think and li listen to the discussions ongoing because, well, I don't think that, well, the roles that they are playing, I mean, they, they sacrifice a lot and you look at what they put their lives in danger in doing most of the things that they do. Yeah. So I'm thinking that, well, if you say that, well, you are not going to take any other, are you saying that, well, then you are not going, you are going to withdraw your services also from there? 
uh, from, from the country? Are you, are you saying that, well, okay, well, now you consider your role to be much more, uh, how do you call it, much more benevolent in nature, and that is where you are going to go. It is, I believe that will let us, at this time, have cool heads to prevail, and then let us not be quite emotional or emotive about it. Let yeah. us consider it once, uh, we, we get to the table and it is said that well yes they need to be paid certain allowances for certain indeed prescribed services indeed uh, given them then they, it should be because what if you work for it if you work for it why wouldn't you very well you deserve why would you take any such allowance very well professor last one then you go the constitution generally places um public officers into two categories you know article 71 office holders and all the other public offices. And clearly, there's some disparity between these two categories of public offices. Indeed, the Constitutional Review Commission uh, report highlights this disparity and calls for a way to actually bridge the gap. You sitting there as a human resource um, specialist, what do you think would be the best way to deal with this disparity between Article 71 office holders and all other public offices? That is, that is very important, and I think that, well, as I said, uh, if you look at it in terms of their, their remuneration and in terms of their conditions of service and so forth and so on, in, in terms of human resources, you are looking at effort-reward relationship in here. So I would rather would think that, well, let us, when, when it comes, I think what is actually creating the problem is not even that it is much more with remuneration and with the rewards, incentives that well, individuals are getting. That is what actually is creating the problem. And indeed, when it comes to salary administration, there are a number of considerations that well, we need to make in, when it comes to salary administration and incentive given to individuals in organization. I would think that, well, there is that need for us to sit back and have a look at the responsibilities assigned these various arms of government and the various people within the public sector, then we can now decide that what? Well, yes, based on the demands and, and based on this is how we're going to assign your emolument and your benefit structure. And based on these people, this is how we're going to. So in salary administration, there are a number of things. You could look at the demand and supply bit as well as one of the ways in determining salary. You should look at the needs bit as well. So there are a number of ways of considering it. I believe that one, the cry, the hue and cry surrounding this bit has to oh, do much more exciting. with the incentives and yeah. what people are taking. If yeah. we can look at what they are doing, then we can structure it appropriately to get people to get what they are doing. And that could, in any way, help in solving the situation. Very well. Thank you so much. Well said. Professor Kwesi Amponsateria, we appreciate your time. Professor Kwesi Amponsateria is a human resource specialist and the head of uh, organization and human resource management of the University of Ghana Business School, University of Ghana, Lego. We do appreciate your time. We'll carry on uh, with a conversation here with uh, Felix Kwachio Fosu here in the studio and um, Richard Asante Yabua on Zoom. Richard, can you hear me? Hello, Richard. I hear you. Good. Okay. So let me come to you uh, so we don't lose you uh, on Zoom. Um, let's, let's uh, obviously following this whole controversial issue, the discussions going on there, first and second ladies not necessarily being caught uh, at the center of this whole discussion. They indicate that, well, of course, this was a recommendation made by a committee they had no business with in terms of setting it, setting it up and all, but yet the issue has come up and they are being um, lambasted. And so they return uh, all monies paid them from 2017. Um, uh, as a party, what, what do you make of that? I think we would want to uh, applaud the first and second lady for the decision taken to uh, refund whatever money that has been paid to them from the time they assumed office as uh, first and second ladies. But I think this goes to tell you the sort of politics that we do in this country. The politics of lack of candor, the politics of hypocrisy, the politics of everything goes where people try to uh, undermine people for no apparent reason. Because indeed, they ought not to have generated any discussion at all, because this has been what has been happening over the years. The only thing that has happened or was supposed to have happened was the fact that these things were being uh, regularized. So that it will not be paid uh, under the table, but people would know indeed what their monies are being used for. That is what was going to happen, looking at the, the recommendation by the committee. You might disagree with the, 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 the constitutionality of the decision by the committee and all that. But beyond that, one cannot 
do the sort of attribution that was done during the period that this issue uh, came up. Where we're being told that the president had decided to pay their wife and uh, 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 the second lady money when Ghanaians are not being given the needed attention and all that. When indeed, those who are making those attributions knew that indeed they were being paid, including the NDC themselves. They knew that Madame Nodina and other former first ladies were being paid, and this culture started as far back as President Rollins. And President Kufo saw it through Mr. Uh, Prof. Mills came and he also did it. Uh, 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 President Mahama also got this opportunity and continued with the tradition because of the fact that we needed to take care of our former first ladies in terms of particularly the, the, those who passed on and passed on and all that, that they needed some level of uh, attention from the state. I thought that, that this shouldn't have generated any difficulty. Because as we speak now, people ask, what is, is the uh, former president, uh, former first ladies working for the state? Is the former second ladies working for the state? I sit here, my brother Felix of Fosukwachi is with President Mahamed's office. He's been paid on a monthly basis by the government. Every month he's paid. So are we saying that my brother Felix is doing more than what these first and second ladies are doing and as I said, they don't deserve to be paid? Is it the argument? Is it a conversation? So I said that, I mean, I'm excited that they chose to refund the monies and also said that they are not even going to take any future monies that would be, uh, 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 that they still would want to pay to them. Because even it came to a point that the media, the sort of imagery that was being created, that these are people who are out there to do and also milk the states. And this was so unfair. We saw the kind of headlines that came up there. So we ask ourselves, I remember to you even getting it wrong by saying that uh, they've been paid some back pays and all that, so they need to refund all those funds. When they have not even been paid, it was a recommendation, but that particular back pay has not been given to them. But they, uh, we had to use getting it wrong in that direction. But then the, the most important thing is that uh, Madam uh, the first lady has refunded, the second lady has refunded. I pray that Madame Rodina will also look at this gesture and also refund hers. So at least we can have a very uh, beautiful conversation going into the future. Because very well. the husband, being the former president, twisting the issues and making them matters milkier and misrepresenting the matters. And these are the issues that we are talking about here. Right. If we can really focus and do politics with some level of candor, do politics with lack of hypocrisy and propaganda, wanting to take advantage of every single event and issue that crops up, and be very fair to ourselves. This ought not to have generated any conversation at all. But I sit here, I know the kind of work that various former uh, first ladies, including the current first lady, has done for this nation. Very well, the Richard. Hospital, the donations, and the mobilization. And most of them, the money they take, they sure. practically be spent it on the nation. Your point it's is made. Them. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Let me have, let me have uh, Felix's uh, perspective as well. well. Definitely, we'll come back to you, uh, Felix. Do you, Abna, do, do you think the first and second ladies have been unfairly treated? You see, Abna... In this whole conversation. You see, Abna, let us put the matters in proper perspective. Mm -hmm. You see, to begin with, those of us in the political class and ruling class, if I may describe it that way, even though I'm not too comfortable with the word class because it connotes I some know. separation, but uh, for the purposes of this group. discussion, maybe, <laughs> yes, maybe political <laughs> group or ruling group. That is a more appropriate <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 nomenclature, mm -hmm. if you ask me. Should have it at the back of our minds that it is not our place to argue with those who vote for us. We should be listening to those who vote for us, not argue with them. Mm -hmm. Essentially, what we are doing is arguing with our bosses. If today, your boss takes exception to your performance and calls you to his office or her office and blasts you. It is not your place to talk back at him or her. Maybe you're just, it you're is just your place. correcting certain no. facts. You know that there, narrative is there better between, perhaps. There's a difference so you between, will need to not, there's set a the record between straight. explaining. Mm -hmm. Even the explanation has to take into consideration their sensibilities and frustrations mm. and the reasons why they are making the statements or advancing the positions that they are advancing. Let me, let me come in here, sorry, sure. but if, in, if that's that line of argument we're making, then why haven't we heeded to their call, which is that scrap this whole thing that, about that setting up the Monuments that. Committee and I'm set not, up an independent yeah, if you allow me. rather than put these two women who... No, not, if, if you allow me, mm -hmm. that is exactly where I'm going. Okay. I'm saying that the people of Ghana, 
who elect their leaders reserve the right to criticize any leader mm. in any way, shape, or form. It is a cardinal principle of leadership and governance that those of us who have the privilege to serve at any time must appreciate. Mm -hmm. It is not our place to talk back at them and argue with them. But, you see, how the MPP has handled this whole matter is a classic example on how not to handle public discontent. Because this argument has arisen in the light of some other things that have imposed extreme hardships on the people. This government and previous governments too have had cause to impose taxation mm. on people. And the excuse has been that our finances are not in the best shape. Indeed, we have heaped tax upon tax upon tax on these people and expect them to pay. Many of them do not receive a commensurate level of investment in their lives or livelihoods mm -hmm. and are struggling to eke out a living. So when they see emolument packages for members of the ruling group, as you would prefer that I call them, <laughs> they are bound to complain. If in the exercise of their right to criticize, there are distortions mm. of the narrative. You can explain it, but in a manner that is respectful and acknowledges their sensibilities. But what they are saying is but, that mm. the NDC, who but I'm coming to the point. Better, you see, this government has a problem. Have not no, 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 no. set the record straight. This, this government, government I mean, made this the situation has a murkier. problem. You know, this government has a problem. Mm. They have a fundamental difficulty in appreciating that every Ghanaian has a right to air his or her view on the way that the affairs of the country are handled, the affairs mm. of the countries are handled. They perceive every criticism as emanating from the NDC. That's, you see, they, ha they have a siege mentality. So they perceive every criticism that even you have not made as coming from the NDC. Rather than seeking to listen and understand exactly what people are saying. It is not only NDC members who have repudiated the current state of affairs. Mm. There are MPP members, known MPP members, who have led the charge. NDC members are no less Ghanaian Regarding the payments of... Regarding the payments of, this, of these allowances. Mm. NDC members are no less Ghanaian than any other person who lives within the jurisdiction. So the tendency to view every criticism as coming from the NDC is informing some of their actions that have deepened the crisis. Mm. And that is why I say that what they have done is a classic example in We're how not to handle do. this context. Let me show you what they've done. Now, you... Uh, Rachel said that the first and second lady need to be commended for returning their, their allowances, the allowances that they paid them since paid 2017. Them. I disagree. There's no commendation to be had. The fact is that there was no requirement for them to refund anyway. But you see... But the pressure. But you the see, again, there's them. a way that you handle these matters mm. that convinces people that you have heard what they are saying. If you read the statement of the first lady, essentially she was saying that, yes, I've been paid money, but because you're angry, take your money. That is disrespectful to the people of Ghana. The people of Ghana have been aware. How is that disrespectful? It is disrespectful to the extent that you have taken the money in the first place. But, but if you have rejected... So let let yeah. us break it down. Let's start. Let's start so I'm going to break it down, yeah. Um, last week, of course, mm -hmm. this conversation had started last week. Last mm -hmm. week, Adam Agbana was here, mm -hmm. the, youth, the deputy youth organizer, mm -hmm. admitting that, yes, this payment of allowances dates mm -hmm. back to... Of course, but it is, a, exactly. it is a known fact. Exactly. So that's the point. Mm -hmm. So... In terms of educating the masses, and not to say that the people listening do not know, but mm -hmm. we are saying that, of course, the media is to serve a certain purpose, mm -hmm. to, you know, correct distortions where mm -hmm. there are any distortions and mm -hmm. put the narrative in the proper perspective mm -hmm. and all of that. So question is, the first ladies as the first and second ladies as the current ladies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, stand, are they entitled to any allowances as previous First but of course, that is not in where. dispute. Look, that is not. Abna, For some people, the Abna, argument Abna, is Abna, that... Abna, no. Yes. What pe people... How did this matter come out? The information minister, when the criticism started, mm -hmm. put out information that the first and second ladies are going to be put on salary as per recommendations made by the Professor Intia Mwabedu Committee, mm -hmm. which recommendations had been approved by Parliament. It was that that triggered... This whole debate sure. and public outcry. It was not the NDC that went anywhere to say that first ladies and second ladies are going to be paid salaries. It was a government action that elicited criticism. After that criticism, if you sought to explain that, oh, we only sought to regularize an existing practice 
But perhaps if the people of Ghana are dissatisfied with their practice, we will take a second look and adopt a better approach that perhaps may be more acceptable to them. That is how a responsible, respectful government approaches this matter. So because so at the end of the day, so it is public funds. It is the exactly. people's money exactly. that you are using. So you don't dispute that. You don't, you don't. But there's you no, don't, no, no, that so has the, never been a problem. No, let me tell I you just, something. No. I mean, let me you tell you. You hold a certain, people, people respect you a lot of because course. of the position you have. Of so course. whatever you say it's carries a, weight. And absolutely. that is why I'm trying to get certain um, statements right from you. Mm -hmm. So is it the case that you have nothing against the payment of allowances but of to course persons. I do not. You don't. I am aware. Listen, Good. I have been there aware. There are people who say mm -hmm. that is not proper. That is because, fine. So that is fine. That is fine. Good. They have the so right. So how do we do that? Listen, how should we do listen, that? Listen, if you allow me, because... Uh, no, but... No, let, let, me, let me build the point. So that I, yes. I agree, but let me build the point. Uh, the, the regular back and forth can distort the narrative a bit. First of all, we have known for over 27 years mm -hmm. that these allowances are paid. Indeed, when it started, it started as a package to help... Former Leaders. first ladies and mm -hmm. wives of vice presidents, many of whom had lost their spouses sure. and so were living in conditions that were less than ideal. Indeed, one of the first people to receive it was the mother of President Akufuado, Mrs. Adeline Akufuado. And incidentally, it was President Akufuado at the time, then Mr. Akufuado, who facilitated the payment to his mom. And rightly so, the good old lady deserved to be looked after by the state when she had fallen into some difficulty by virtue of the loss of his spouse. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. She cannot be disparaged for it. And nobody so that's has one category. It. That is one category. When you seek to elevate it mm -hmm. in ways that are extra-constitutional and do not comply with Ghanaian law, people always have the right to raise issue. Now, if you seek to explain it, you must explain it in a tone and language that is acceptable to the people. But you don't throw tantrums and thump your nose in their face and tell them that, oh, the, some of the comments are distasteful, so I'm paying back. Good. If in the beginning you had rejected it outright, people would have known that you are coming from a certain place. Why? There are ministers of state yeah. who refuse to take their salary as a goodwill gesture to the people of this country. Mm. People appreciate that. Sure. They are the ones who will have the right in future, if they are accused of some wrongdoing, or even if the narrative is distorted, mm. to express some disquiet. The other issue we is that, take a break, so the other issue is that play. why? Mm -hmm. People have said that, oh, the first lady engages in philanthropic gesture, gestures. And so it is necessary to give her this or this salary as recommended by the commission. Look, I disagree. The reason why it is philanthropy is that you don't benefit from it. If it is not philanthropy, you cannot... Sorry, the reason why it's not... You don't get paid for it because it is philanthropy. It is charity. Mm. You are giving it away for free. In any event, Mrs. Akufuado is only able to do the things she is doing because of the magnanimity of the Ghanaian voter who decided to give her husband the opportunity to be president. In her previous guise as a private citizen, even if she was doing these things, it was very, very minimal. Not to this level. She hadn't built a neonatal intensive care unit for babies when she was a private mm -hmm. citizen. She is only able to do it because she has a certain status conferred exactly. on her by the people of Ghana. Two, because of that position, she is able to mobilize resources from both state and non-state actors. Some of the money that she has used for these things have come from state entities. She will not have had access to that, had she, but for the fact that exactly. Ghanaians voted for her. So that performance of philanthropic gestures cannot become a justification for getting paid. Indeed, Very she's well. not the only one. Very I can exactly. give you a tall list right of what Mrs. Right Mahama has done. But Very it will well. not we justify paying her mm -hmm. salary. But let me tell you what the allowances are for. Look, even ministers of state, the president, mm. despite his salary, he gets an allowance. When he travels, anytime he sure. travels, he's paid per day. What is an allowance? So allowances have existed all this while, even for those who are paid salaries. So is the by name virtue, that has been put on it, that no, is a problem no, in the quantum it, or what? By virtue of the election of her husband as president, the first lady is suddenly thrust into the public limelight. Even though she does not have a defined set of responsibilities by way she of being president, there mm -hmm. are there are functions that she performs that, albeit unofficial, are also beneficial to the state. And it's not about the charity or philanthropy. You and I can engage in charity and philanthropy sure. even if we are not in mm -hmm. government. You understand me? For instance, one of them, anytime the president goes on a state visit. Alex, we need to take a break. To the extent, okay, why? why we need to back? take a break. When, when we come, come back, back right. we'll, we'll look at that. All so, right. this is a key mm. point, and uh, we are look, this, discussing the issue about um, salaries or allowances paid to presidential spouses, first lady, second lady, and the propriety or otherwise of it. We'll take a break. When we come back, we speak to our guests, uh, Richard Asante Yabua and Felix Kwachufu. So, stay with us.
If you're still watching and listening to The Key Points, we're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7, online at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So currently having a conversation about uh, the presidential spouse uh, allowances and or salaries debate that has come up following uh, the recommendation by the um, Professor Intiamwa Beidou Committee Report. And um, we have in the studio Mr. Felix Kwachu Fosu, former uh, Deputy Minister for Communications. And on Zoom, we have Mr. Richard Asante Yabwa, Deputy Director of Communications with the New Patriotic Party. So let me come to you, Richard. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Good, yes. So uh, you, you heard Felix's submissions. Um, the arrangement, this arrangement, as we all know, has been there in the, for as long as we know. It started for a certain purpose, catering uh, to the needs of, uh, you know, widows of past presidents or heads of states, and it followed through till current times. Uh, according to Felix, he didn't think that, you know, contrary to your submission, where you were actually um, commending the first and second ladies for returning the monies paid them from 2017, he says, well, uh, he doesn't see any. Uh, need for commendation, it, 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 you know, there was no um, duty on them to return the money anyways. Uh, what do you make of that and generally your reaction? I'm to not surprised. I'm, I'm not, I wasn't expecting anything different from Phyllis in that regard. I mean, he spoke as Phyllis with all known uh, with the NDC and they, they, they are, they're thinking and the mindset and what they seek to achieve with all this game that they play. I was surprised that he also put across that the farmer, the, the, the first lady uh, returned this money, then the second lady returned this money because of criticism. No, she said that she did not want the case being made by the president, the effort of the president, and the work out, the, instead of the cameras and, the, and, the, and the, the, the information coming to the public, the focus is being placed on matters like this. So that was the reason. In as much as he said that she also decried the, the sort of insult and the insinuations and the stance that were being taken by people when those individuals ought to know better, particularly the former president, Mahama. That is why people were making calls, including my humble self, asking my sister, Madame Lodina, to return sin. I mean, it, it is, it is, and remember the first lady said that whatever she's doing, she's not t trying to tell others to return their money. It is in their own conscience if they think that they want to return. But I do believe that somebody like Madame Lodina ought to return the money if she has the money available with her. Because the issue is that when your husband creates the impression that somebody is doing something bad, and indeed that's not the situation. When the NDC as a political party, at the initial instance, when these informations are not got into the populace, created the impression that this is what is happening. It's the same thing that we are talking about, like what we spoke about in uh, uh, Honorable Kennedy Japan's issue. That's fully such and so. Honorable Kennedy Japan said that people should go and beat, he said they should go and beat people. He never said that. He said that, oh, if he was a president, we would have beaten, you would have caused this guy to be beaten. Come on. But you sat but, on the station Richard, and said that... Richard, we, we are done with that conversation, but are you trying to justify that statement? No, it can be justified, seriously. But I say, let, no, we are not justifying... See, when you are asking for the, 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 the true reportage, whatever was said by individuals to be played out there, to be said to the people, without being garnished or being a stretch with that uh, propaganda uh, this in mindset, that ought to be taken... I'm not saying that whatever he said is good or bad, but my point is that present the issue as it is. You are saying that the man said people should go and beat, he should, people should go and beat uh, Erasmus. But that's what he said. That's what he said. But Felix said that this morning. So this is the kind of politics that we do. When this issue came up, we were told that President Akufuado had decided to pay, even I saw a headline from Train Network, where the, the online portal said that uh, the first lady and the second lady are supposed to be paid salaries and they are going to be paid salaries. They did not present the issues that ought to be. So these are the things that we talk about. That, you know what? Misreportage, it's a major challenge. And it, I don't want to say that. But to say that, did you say three, three, three news put out something which was not correct because of there was course. a reportage that said first and second ladies are to be paid salaries? That was a recommendation yes, yes. by the committee, no, no, wasn't no, it? I mean, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the context of which they got that, that, that was a, that Felix, was a recommendation by the committee. So Felix it's Felix only comes, reporting what the when, committee when had Felix said. In, when Felix comes in and he's speaking, I'll pick, I'll pull out the exact quotation for you 
for you to realize the sort of the, the malicious uh, intent behind that sort of a uh, uh, projection and what was put out there. I mean, I have no difficulty criticizing public officers. I have no difficulty anybody criticizing the president, the former, uh, 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 the, the current first ladies and second ladies, second ladies. My challenge is that present the accurate information to the general population. Do not create the impression that this something wrong or something on tours has been done. That's the issue. At every step of the way, we create the impression that somebody's doing something bad, when indeed we are well aware that nothing bad was being done. Ask ourselves, is the, until the discussion went further and further on, the ordinary Ghanaian was made to believe that this was the first time this thing is being instituted by President Akufuado, and he's doing the same because he wants to pay the wife, and his, those payments are to start from 2017. This is what the Ghanaian were made to believe at the initial instance. And I'm saying that this sort of politicking is unfair. When you do that, you try to create suffering for the person who is at the helm of affairs. And I cited instances that President Mahama is being paid as a former president. Nobody has issues with that. He's been given all kinds of luxuries to operate his office, including personnel to help man his office, including my brother, Felicia, who is being paid by the state. Nobody has issues with that. So when you say that a former first, uh, a first lady who is executing and doing all kinds of work to project the country, assist the country in diverse means, and you list all kinds of things and create the impression that this, they are not deserving of the money that they are paying, being paid. And so you know what? I do not want the focus for national discourse on the things that have been done by my husband, the president, the, the work that has been done, the various projects that have been executed, the various relief packages that have been given to the populace, the jobs that have been created across the length and breadth of the, of the country, roads construction and all those things. I do not want to focus to move from those things and come to issues that borders on what ought to be given to me as a first lady. Very well. bringing, um, Richard, let me ask you this question. I, that I would, at every point in time, appreciate that sort of gesture and that effort. Very well. Let me ask you this question. So it's, it, it's, it's something that has been done for, for as long as we know. What is it about the system as it is currently that the government thought that it ought to be formalized? I mean, the mere fact that these things were being done and uh, uh, and in the uh, under the cover of uh, somebody's tabletop payment system. But that isn't the case, is it? It's not tabletop payment. That, that's exactly what. Is I mean, that well, it? The point was that the, 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 the point was that it has not been formalized. What has been done is that people were being paid based on what whoever is the president feels. But let me ask this, formal, does formalization necessarily mean that they need to be put on the level of cabinet ministers, for instance? So salaries at the level of um, cabinet ministers. Is that what constitutes formalization? And strangely, in the past years, even during the era of uh, President Obama, if my memory serves me right, and I stand to be corrected on this, I think the payments were made at the level of the cabinet ministers. And remember, this was a recommendation from a committee that went to parliament, which was approved by parliament. It was Very parliament that approved it. It is not the executive, the president who approved it. Very well. So if that people were, to, were, were being questioned, parliament mm. needed to answer these questions. And nobody needed to point their uh, fingers at the president. Very well. Uh, we have just about five minutes to wrap yeah, up. See, I'm, I'm going to split the time. But yes, yes the I'm whole essence about formalizing it. You see, I'm as I'm as see, that we just need to clarify that. Yeah. Allowances are as formal as they get. Mm -hmm. They are documented. Even per diems paid to officials who travel outside the country are documented. So they are very formal. What they sought to do was to elevate the first and second ladies to the level of Article 71 office holders. As per the recommendations of the committee, they said that parliament had approved so they could go ahead. Meanwhile, it was illegal. You are the lawyer. It was unconstitutional. It's currently before the Supreme Absolutely. Court, you know that. So but when it comes to that... Listen, listen they are, the two mm -hmm. ladies are not part they are not, of yes, Article 71 Not office. mentioned there. So there is even no debate about the matter. But it's before the court. So no, that's no, why no, I say that's nobody not nobody exactly. has a difficulty with that. The other issue is that, you see, the MPP are living in a delusional bubble. They, can, they are tone deaf. They cannot separate genuine sentiment from political statements. This, fix, this uncanny fixation that they have with President Mahama, that as for him, he doesn't have the right to speak about any matter. I don't know where that comes from. Where do they get the right to confer on anybody in Ghana the right to speak or the right not to speak? In any event, it is obvious that either the president or his vice or the leadership of the MPP government have not read President Mahama's statements. President Mahama recounted the history of these payments. Mm -hmm. So they claim that he said that it was the first time that it was being done. It's totally false. In fact, the very first person to put it out there, 
that in fact the payment the payment started from the time of President Rawlings was Nana Tudazi, the chief of staff under President Rawlings, not the MPP government. They claim that it started with President Kufuor. We corrected the record that it actually started with President Rawlings. That is why I gave you the example of the payment to President Kufuor's mom, the late Mrs. Adelina Kufuor. So they concoct their own falsehoods, fabricate claims, and then launch attacks on the former president. Again, the reason why I reject the first lady's statement outright, and I say it is devoid of any moral value, because it was just to occasion a piece of bizarre propaganda against the person of Mrs. Lodina Mahama. Why are they focusing on Mrs. Lodina Mahama? Why are but they she not in no, her no, statement no. that it's without yes. prejudice to but, any other. But soon after that, the government first information lady, machinery, first lady. No, the government information machinery mm -hmm. was used to propagate propaganda, calculated attacks at the person of Lodina Mahama, including oh, my brother. Is, you, you you, it. is it proper Madame, to put I, it no, on the first lady? Listen, listen, listen to me. I'm saying that every public official is subject to criticism. Mm -hmm. The first lady is not immune to criticism. Mm -hmm. So the mere fact that you've been criticized does not mean that a government should go into the dark art of propaganda and Very target well. So we should target, to go. we should target Mrs. Teresa Kufuor and Mrs. Ramat, uh, wait, Ramatou wait. Mahama because, because the first lady has been criticized. Felix, I don't think let, me just have, let me just give the rest of the time to Richard. Oh, but I'm like, I just spoke for no, two minutes. It's not fair. Two minutes? He's, 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 only has he's spoke for ten minutes. I have spoken for no, two minutes. I have to give you the last word on this matter. Please. Felix, just be fair. You know, I mean, he definitely also has to have his last word. Yes. Uh, you only have 30 no, seconds, so please don't lament. Just yeah, carry on. Yeah, do not take on due advantage of your presence in the studio. Well, it's not my fault that you're not in the studio. As far as <laughs> I'm concerned, you were. 30 invited. seconds. If you fail to I'm show not, up, I cannot I'm be faulted for it. Yeah. Not, I think uh, we need to understand this. And going forward as a country, we need to take away insults from the kind of politics that we do and also be fair to the facts. We need to appreciate when good things are being done. We need to also be mindful of the, uh, the reportage from the various media outlets and the things they see. We need to also understand that as a population, in as much as the media can criticize, we, their work can also be brought under scrutiny. So when they are being scrutinized, people ought not to see them to be they're being condemned. Because at the end, they, when they go wrong, we also need to say that. We also need to appreciate the good work being done by the offices of both the of uh, uh, the first lady and the second lady. What has been done is extremely awesome. The great work that they are doing, we need to appreciate that. We need to also understand that in politics, at every point in time, what matters is the populace. And the president has indicated that he will do everything possible to transform this country. And he's deep doing it. We know the job that are being created. We know the roads that are being fixed. We know the water that are being uh, expanded across the country. Electricity work that has been done. All these things are being done to make sure that we project this country. And I, I, I would say kudos to the MPP and the president for the great work that has been done at the moment. Thank, Thank you very much for that. For that. Than previous Thank you very much. Like, Thank you very no much. No previous that men pay the best they salaries. That's fine. That's fine. No, but let, me, let me just thank no, my viewers and listeners. I mean, all allow of that, me that does not justify paying the salaries that. to the first and second Thank you so much, Felix Kwachi Ufos, former deputy minister of communications, and Richard Asante Yoboa, the deputy director of communications with the MPP. And it's been an exciting time here. I do appreciate your time. And also to you, our viewers and listeners, thank you so much for spending your Saturday morning with us. We do appreciate your time. We'll be back here same time next week. Until then, let the conversation go on and stay safe and stay well. See you next week. Bye-bye.